Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 Good. And um, so, uh, thank you for having me, first of all. I'm feeling a little bit under pressure here now because of all the nasty things that are being said about my country. And <laughs> um, unfortunately, it's very true. Um, I think a lot of people will be aware of it, and I've been speaking to some people today who are not aware of this at all, so it's kind of I'm very aware of what's happening in England, um, and I'm going to tell you what's been happening in Ireland. Um, I'm here today, uh, I work with a couple of NGOs in Ireland, I work full-time with the Irish Wildlife Trust, and now, and as we've kind of alluded to, uh, money has been a big issue, and not a lot of the NGOs in Ireland are actually on their knees at the moment, and there's very, very little happening with them, and uh, also, some of them are very much... Uh, in the pocket of government due to funding and other related issues and things like that. But um, so as you can see here, the selection of, uh, of the bodies across the bottom that I'm um, representing here today, um, and my friend who just spoke there, we're constantly in contact there as well. So it's nice that we're having these cross-border kind of uh, talks and uh, work is going on. So Ireland, um, I also went to uh, schools a lot, and I also deal with people at retirement age, and basically I'm just bringing nature and ecology into the classrooms and into the uh, the lecture theatre, um, and I just I like this particular slide. We, obviously, badgers occur from uh, Galway to Tokyo in terms of the species that we see, and you can see our Eurasian, the um, mid, mid, or the, um, and then going right across the Japanese species, which are quite interesting there. Interestingly, Ireland has a very much an island dynamic, so our actual lists are species is actually quite a lot lower than England. So it's just basically animals are still being colonising Ireland, so to speak, after the ice ages. Um, in terms of numbers in Ireland, we are down to possibly 70,000, uh, which ties in very nicely with our uh, island area of 70,000 kilometres. So we are talking about overall of about uh, one badger per square kilometre. And this was recently backed up with me by talking to the Department of Agriculture. So we were hovering around sort of the 80,000 mark, and we believe it's actually even lower than that again. As you can see from the uh, positioning on the map, this is Biodiversity Ireland. They occur pretty much everywhere on the island. Uh, and you can even see that they don't particularly like Loch Ness because it's a bit of an issue for them. <laughs> um, the Irish badger is quite interesting, and there has been more to say that it's it possibly uh, a subspecies in its own right. Uh, we have a Lusitanian dynamic. We actually have a couple of uh, subspecies in Ireland: our cold tit, our stoves, our hare, uh, the dipper. We have quite a, uh, a list of uh, subspecies that are unique to Ireland as well, which we're very proud of. Uh, in terms of numbers, there was some work going back into '95 where we had a hugely overinflated population, and it was based on, extrapolating based on English sort of dynamics and badgers in terms of the woodland dynamic, larger social groups, and we are quite different from that point of view. Unfortunately, Ireland is a country of fields. We all know it's a hugely agricultural country. Not so much in crops, but very much so in terms of beef and dairy. Um, crops, not so good because it's so wet. I can tell you it's quite wet. Um, but, absolutely critical to the question in terms of talking about Ireland is that beef exports, dairy exports, are our bread and butter, so to speak. And it's a big part of the culture, and it's a big part of the mindset, and it's a big part of the problem. So we had an overinflated figure based on the UK extrapolations, and then when we brought it down, where our social groups tend to be one, two to five badgers, much, much smaller groups. And that's because you guys have a woodland dynamic, we have a hedge, hedgerow dynamic, much smaller areas to, to work in from that point of view. Um, persecution is obviously a big issue. Before we even start talking about the call, we've got the sort of 20% of sets show digging and blocking activity. Um, we're seeing a huge proportion. So we've got, we're currently at 33,000 known sets. And as I get to that, the government know exactly where each and every one of these sets are. And then over the annexes are in the outlier sets as well. They have absolutely incredible detail on that level, which is unfortunate. Um, and as you can see there, we're having, we have culled 112,000 now in the government programme. And this, as you'll get to see, is done in quite a horrific way. Um, and then we're talking at 15 to 20 percent, depending, uh, in, are killed on the roads annually. And then Mike Rendell, who just spoke about Northern Ireland, mentioned that there was only one officer feeding into the whole police force of 7,000, but we have none. So we have no dedicated wildlife crime people at all. And it would be very, very low on the priority list uh, in terms of the police force taking heat to any of these things. And then when you would kind of, in Ireland, you have sort of natural England would be, uh, we'd have the Na National Parks and Wildlife Services, the NPWS, um, and they are hugely underfunded and they're hugely overstretched. And they started off being underfunded and they've been cut back about 40% in the last couple of years as well. So any of the rangers are completely, and they have huge tracks, huge areas to, to try and cope with. 
So basically, any illegal activity, really, it's either unreported or nothing's really happening there. And it's happening a lot. And pointing my finger back at you guys, we have a lot of people coming in from the UK um, to actually take part in activity in Ireland. And the, the hardest part of it all for me is that the authorities that are aware of some of the individuals in Ireland who organise these things set up accommodation, the whole package, and, but they don't have hard and fast evidence that we can actually use against them. But it's that, that kind of level. And this map down here is just the members of the public who are just putting in road kills. So when you talk about sort of the numbers that we're getting up there, we've got 766 of members of the public who bother to go onto a website to put in a finding. So you can imagine how high the numbers of road kills are. This is an early map that we were using in the campaign. So things have changed a bit, but at the time, in the UK, you had dropped by 37%. Things were going quite well here. And in Northern Ireland, as Mike Lendon showed you on those yearly maps, they had dropped things down. This is without pulling. They had dropped things down significantly as well. Whereas in Ireland, we were still having a big problem. Um, and we spoke, uh, I spoke to Yak outside, who told me about a guy from England who discovered the first badger uh, with TV over here. And he then came to Ireland and discovered the badger in Ireland. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but once the badger was discovered in Ireland, it was subsequently discovered across all 26 counties. Um, the Irish TB eradication scheme, it kicked in originally. We had huge, huge numbers. I put this graph together. Are we just, we're missing bits, but anyway. Um, going back to 1959, so we'd say 1960, and that's when the eradication program was brought in by our uh, Taoiseach at the time. Our Premier was Charlie Hockey. It might be a name some people recognise, but uh, he's now looked on as being a bit of a gangster. Very successful politician. <laughs> but one of the things that he did do very well was he brought in this TB eradication programme. But it was all around testing movements, passports, identification, all that kind of stuff. And as you can see, in the first seven or so years, they had an absolutely massive success. And they were coming from a very, very bad place. And Charlie Cotton rightly said at the time, I'm not a fan of his, by the way, but he rightly said at the time, we have to solve this problem. Our economy is absolutely going down the drain. We don't have any water there. Can I have some water, please? Um, and as you can see, we were very, very successful in the first seven years or so. Again, it was movements, testing, identification, things like that. Uh, and then they basically hit kind of the dozens. There wasn't a whole lot happened. And this is when, uh, in 1984, we had the budget pulling program starts to kick in. And this is the kind of, this is coming up to 2014 is in here. Thank you very much, Tommy. I'm impersonating Mike Lendl then. Dave Adams is better, yeah? yeah. Um, so as you can see, um, the Badger program, now it depends on who you talk to, but some people say, well that's quite significant. The Irish government are delighted about the last couple of years, and they tend to quote, they give you windows, they pick their windows. Yeah. But yeah, my argument is that we can go back, and we can see things that, and when you start talking about the numbers, the other thing to keep in mind is we spoke about the current population is about 70,000. We tend to have 7 million head of cattle in Ireland. So we go between 5 and 7 million. Um, and it is a bovine disease. So one of, one of the biggest arguments, and I should have said at the beginning, I'm a lay person, by the way. I don't have a degree in zoology or ecology or things like that. I've done lots of nature-related stuff, but not at that kind of level, so be gentle with me. Um, but from that point of view, um, my true belief, and I don't think anyone will contradict me, we've managed to wipe out all the batteries in Ireland and England tonight. We would still have TV issues in Canada in the next 10 or 20 years. We just will not change that. That's a gra the graph on a, a bigger level. But I think another lesson to be learned from it is that just those capital measures alone, at the beginning, did so much. So, these are the, I'm going to shoot along as well a bit. These are the measures that were brought in again, as I said, tagging bovine passport, hair registers. The registers are a bit dodgy from my point of view as well because they're farm, the farmer actually feeds the registers. So that's the farmers that are inputting the data. And I think that, that could be a little uh, dodgy, let's say. Um, and then we had uh, testing. Now, <laughs> the skin test was the general test that was in place. And we know that it can be quite ineffective and it can lead to false negatives and false positives. Uh, leading infection in herds. Uh, I'm not going to bore you because you know about TB, TB and badgers. The big trials in terms of Ireland, when we talk about England, we talk about Krebs, we talk about Bourne, we talk about the random badger pull. 
In Ireland, the big ones were the Eastophany project, and that was ripped to pieces by the science world, let's say, um, because they felt it wasn't, it was in one geographic area, it didn't kind of relate to the rest of the country. It was too sort of centralised in this one area, and also it was surrounded by boundaries, so there was actually uh, rivers and motorways and different things like that that were causing boundaries, um, and it also meant that the perturbation effect was locked in, so it didn't give a real result. So to try and sort of get around that, the Irish government put on another project, the Four Areas Project, and then that was placed in very far from <coughs> farmers of the country to try and show that they were trying it in different areas. Um, but basically, surprise, surprise, ever both of the projects that the government put on, the result was Culling Badgers was very successful and it brought the levels of TV down in Capital. I'm not going to bore you telling you about what you already know already. Um, that's the, uh, the perturbation effect. Um, again, this is born and the fact that badger pulling won't make any meaningful um, contribution to reducing TV in cattle, and cattle measures alone are going to make a difference. So let's get on to what's actually happening in Ireland. Um, so the Irish strategy, it's called the medium term strategy, and it's called the medium term strategy because it has always been sold as this is what we're going to do until we can find something better. And I'm being balanced here, so sometimes what I'm saying is what they're saying. So that's what, where they're coming from. They're always sort of saying, this is a medium thing, we're going to try and get to the likes of vaccination or something else like that in the long term. Um, so what actually happens is we have the, I'll just jump for a second because this is the, the most important part. Of it. This is the weapon of choice uh, for the Irish strategy and believe it or not I'm not supposed to call that a snare. So everybody we have to change our wording, we have to refer to this as a, 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 a loot restraint <laughs> or a stop body restraint. You can take your pick but you're not allowed to call it a snare. Um, but just going back to it for a second, this is the key part here. I have a button of technology, look. Um, this is the stop. So the logic being that small animals can't get caught in it, and it's not supposed to, the badger will get caught, it will hold them in place, this is what we're, we're told. It will hold the badger in place until somebody it won't damage them at all, it'll be fine until somebody comes along and shoots them in the head with a rifle. So that's, that's the plan there. So the, the science behind it really is that we have, um, ERAD is the, TV eradication program in Ireland, and it's run out of um, a centre down in Mexford who basically um, are sending out all the information to all the DBOs, all the district veterinary offices. And all of this activity is licensed by the National Park and Wildlife Services, so natural England, I suppose, from your point of view. And um, there is some issues with that that have cropped up recently that we are going to have a look at from a legal point of view because they should be sort of on a more case by case basis, but we found out recently that they just uh, fire them out for a county every year. So they just fire out these kind of blanket licenses, which we think there's definite issue uh, with that. Um, the centre in Wexford has fed all its information from UCD College in Dublin. There's a centre there called Sevira, and they basically have a, a very high tech mapping system there. So it's GIS mapping system. They have, they have 33,000 sets on the system, and it shows all the main sets, the outliers, and the annexes. And when you see the maps, it will have all these funny little footnote numbers beside all the different sets. And those different numbers are technically four or six things like that. That's the number of snares that they feel are needed to cull out that set. And it's a reactive program. So they're not out culling batteries higgledy piggledy, so to speak. And it's a reaction to an outbreak. So if there's an outbreak, the whole country is broken up into parcels of land down to herds and to land ownership. And then they will go in and they'll look for the cause of the outbreak. Has it come from somewhere else? Has cattle been brought in? Different things like that. If they can't find another cause for the outbreak, then they'll start to look at the badger situation. And in that case, then they look at all the parcels of land within uh, 1.5 kilometers of the outbreak. They'll contact all the landowners, they'll write to them, and they'll basically say, We'd like to come onto your land and perform some badger related activities. And there's a footnote at the bottom of the letter saying, If we don't hear back from you, we will proceed with our badger related activities on your property which is a bit like saying, if I ring your doorbell and you don't answer your door, I'm going to kick your door in. <laughs> uh, and then they basically come and they cut out the sets. Um, now, on the one hand, I'm very unhappy, but they're, they're actually, like Mike Randall said about Jared, the, the guys in the uh, Department of Agriculture have been very upfront and been very transparent, and they've always met us whenever we requested it. Um, on the snares, um, 
they reckon that up to 6,000 snares can be set every night. So that doesn't mean that the guys down there are actually putting down 6,000 snares every night. It just means that the ones that were set a few days ago are still set and so on and so forth, so it accumulates. But we can have up to 6,000 snares set at a particular night. And then they claim that they can have all those snares checked by midday the next day. Now, if you, if you press them on that, they get quite irate about it. They say, absolutely, and if we find out there's any batteries in it past the timeline, that operator will be fired. But I just can't see how it's possible. It's not possible. Um, so it's the TV Wildlife Unit um, in the Department of Agriculture that's taking care of taking care of the badgers in the Mafia Centre, I should say. Um, so the Wildlife Unit is generating all these maps, and the, the capture blocks are basically picking the parcels of land, finding where the sets are in relation to the parcels of land, deciding um, how many snares are involved, and then sending out operators to pull out the sets. Um, they manage the database. Um, I, don't, I hate keeping reading uh, this stuff back to me. One of the important things is uh, you wonder who are these guys that are going off out into the countryside and setting these snares? Well, strangely, they use the Farm Relief Services, the FRS, they use uh, personnel from Farm Relief Services. So those guys would normally be going out and helping out with milking, harvesting, different things like that where farmers need men on the ground. So that's, they use that. And then also the Irish Equine Centre. Very strange. Um, but the numbers are huge. So uh, on average, you're talking about around 6,000 badgers a year are getting pulled out on a yearly basis. Um, and that's a sea bear here, Centre for Veterinary Epidemiology, uh, Epidemiology and Risk Analysis. Um, and again, these guys are pushing um, the fact that they're going to be working on, um, on vaccines, and there has been some work done on that. Again, Tom stole my thunder a bit there on the Bern Convention. But, uh, so I won't get into too, in too much detail, but as you can see here, um, the badge is protected by Irish and European law, um, and it's not doing a very good job of it. But there, these are some of the things that stand out. Basically, you're protected, but if, if there's a threat to crops, livestock, things like that, then there's mitigation, then you're able to, to go in and um, reduce numbers and things like that. Or if it's an interest in public safety. Uh, I don't want to mention any names, but this is the guy here, look, see, Eladio Fernandez Galliano. <laughs> so he's the main man in the Council of Europe. We made a complaint to Bern, um, to the Council of Europe under Bern, and basically it's, it is being refreshed, which is great news, and it is going to be going before them, and hopefully it will get before them in December. But at the time it was basically dismissed. And importantly, uh, he came back to us and basically said, look, sorry guys, thanks for making the effort. But Bern is a tool, it's a kind of gentleman's agreement. We don't like, like to upset the member states. Badgers aren't really uh, you know, in trouble in Ireland in terms of numbers and as a species. And that was basically it. So don't fully understand how it's cropped back up again, but it's being refreshed and it's going before them again. So I think this is where the likes of Tom and myself and Mike Rendell and getting the different countries to come together. This is what could actually make a difference. This is my friend Simon Coveney here now. He's uh, so sort of the anti-badger we call him. So he's the guy who's making all the uh, policies now that are, are, are causing the problems. And another big issue that we had in terms of the uh, wildlife protection was the fact that there was closed seasons. And initially, um, uh, the closed season was in June to August, which we couldn't understand because the closed season is basically to protect females above ground that are lactating so that you're not left with cubs starving to death below ground. And we kind of pushed them on, on it in terms of the times of the year and uh, we reckon January to July would make a hell of a lot more sense. I know it's a big stretch in terms of time, but that would make sense in terms of pregnancy, birth, weaning, and things like that. But we went back to them and said, well, why was it June and August in the first place? And that's when the operators would like to take their holidays. <laughs> so. And actually that was said with a smile. So these guys do not feel threatened by us at all. It was like, we don't care guys, this is, this is how it is. Um, uh, and then the other aspect of it is that in the legislation, it says the number one thing you're not supposed to do is killed by indiscriminate means that will cause suffering, so on and so forth, be a danger to other wildlife, whatever. And the first thing that they point out is snares. So it's really cut and dry from that point of view. Uh, this is an unfortunate badger here. There's actually a snare wire attached into the bottom of the fence post there. I'm not... I'm, I could fill the screen up with loads of gruesome, gory details, which is not something that we need to see, but we can imagine. Um, 
This is the stopped harness restraint. They have loads of looped body restraint, loads of different names for a snare. Uh, the Department of Agriculture of Ireland have come back and they basically said that this is the best possible way of practicing badgers. And I was talking to you last night. Um, their argument being they reckon cage trapping causes uh, an awful lot of damage to badgers in their nail beds and their teeth in terms of trying to escape from the cage and stuff. So that's their argument. Um, but the, and then they have done research, but their own research we always have found very, very untrustworthy. Um, but the, what's coming back to us now, we actually put in a freedom of information application a while back and we've only really received the information now, but there's an absolute ton of it. And it seems that there have been pets, animals, um, deer, um, and all sorts of very nasty badger related things where they really have put themselves up. Uh, one operator who actually spoke to us told us that in the common occurrence was that they'd actually arrive and the snare works by a solid metal uh, stake that goes into the ground and then the wire is coming off it. That can, there's often a big circular track going around it where the badgers have been somersaulting around um, for a long period of time. So it really is very, very horrific. Um, and as you can see, some of them, and, and actually the same guy said it as well, sometimes when they approached live badgers that were still alive in the traps, some of them were actually really freaking out because there was a human approaching them and they were all very, very stressed out. And some of them had just given up. They basically had just given up on the spot. Um, another part of the legislation, which is very important, in both in terms of Irish and particularly in the Bering Convention, was about local population loss. And we have seen uh, local population loss in very big numbers. And people that are going out and looking at sets are coming back and saying sets are completely empty, they're all dormant, they're pulled out. Um, my personal experience of going up and looking at sets in Wicklow is that they're, I'm not aware of any active sets at the moment. Um, Tim Roper wrote uh, this book where he mentions Ireland in it, and Andrew uh, Byrne, who actually works in uh, UCD in Seaver, has actually alluded to it himself. So he's actually working in the wildlife unit that's part of the programme. The response from the Irish government to Bern is, and any time we challenge them, they trot out papers that are 10 and 12 years old, the same stuff over and over again. But as I've said before, they pick a window that suits them. And that said, if I was to come from the other side, we have achieved big results in terms of reducing TB. So that's a difficult argument to try and get into. The important thing to note though is what they're not telling you is that to achieve this and they point of badger pulling as being such an important factor in it, during this period of time we had fewer numbers of herds by quite significant, we had much uh, lower numbers in the actual overall national herd and we had a huge increase in testing and also the interferon gamma, uh, gamma test had increased as well. These are massive factors, these are massive capital measures in making a difference. Um, and then we're very concerned about the shortcomings of the actual skin test, which is still being used generally as well. And then getting into vaccination. I don't want to get into too much of this because I think we're going to have other, other thoughts on that as well. And then back, badger vaccination being the way forward. Now, actually, I really take the point uh, that was made earlier on today that it points the finger at badgers in the same way. Um, and I think it would be great, um, like my personal choice would be to try and get down the route of vaccination capital. And um, from an Irish point of view, looking at England, in Ireland we are completely dependent on exports. And we export a lot of live cattle as well. I think England is actually in a position where it could actually really meet its own demand, it doesn't need to send anything abroad, um, and you have a lot more scope from that point of view. And the, the money involved in Ireland is massive. So the money involved in the disease eradication programs across the board for cattle is absolutely huge, but the biggest ones are TB and brucellosis, and TB is massive. But in terms of the badger program alone, it's a massive cost. But as you can see, a huge part of the cost is in compensation to farmers. Um, and then, you see the little purple? TB in cattle research. <laughs> Um, so that's basically the strategy that's happening in Ireland. Uh, from, if I was a government person speaking here supporting it, I'd be able to say that there's been a huge reduction in TV in the country, and I'd point at the, the badger pull as being very successful. And 
even thinking of recently, they actually uh, said it to us, oh, we don't follow the battery pull up as being the number one reason that we've got from TV down so low. And then they handed us sleep that says, you know, like the gift they always hand you to try and cater you when you're going on. And the very first page of it was like, how we reduce TV in Ireland by killing batteries. So it's absolutely the, um, <laughs> the um, PR that's going out there. And another big issue uh, for me personally as well is the fact that we're being held up as the sort of best practice and all this sort of stuff and being head out, head out like that across the world. And uh, this is just some slides I've tacked on because I only actually got them on, I flew over here yesterday and I only got these as far as the evening. So this is coming from the National Parks and Wildlife Services lady called Anna Mullins. And she's working with the Department of Agriculture and they were doing a really excellent bit of work with the GPS collars on badgers and Wicklow. And um, they were basically tracking their movements. A lot of it was in relation to um, motorways that were going in at the time and looking at movements and things like that. But it clearly shows the uh, territories of the groups. And there is a little bit of intermingling, but you can also see them um, very clearly holding their territories. And then the nice part about it was, is that they were able to see where the farmers who were, and actually we have quite a lot of farmers who are very supportive of our side of things and aren't happy about the, the badger cut at all. And would prefer, they understand that if the badgers in their section are taken out, they're going to have other badgers coming in, which they feel is, so let's say farmers that have healthy badgers are very, they value them. The research here has really shown that badgers do avoid cattle. They avoid, um, uh, going into fields that the cattle are in, and then uh, when the cattle are moved on, they go in quite quickly after that. But um, th that's quite interesting. And then on from that, they moved on, and they discovered when they started looking at farmyards. <coughs> th this is a lot of coloured uh, coloured badgers now, so there's quite a lot of money involved. And in uh, 21 males, 19 females, 12 social groups, three years of data, over 58 farmyards in a relatively good area. It's the first. Um, free-ranging badgers. So this work had been done before, but they weren't gps and they didn't have this level of data. And it's shown up all of these interesting uh, aspects of it in terms of social groups and their, their types of farms that they're visiting. But guess what? They avoid farmyards. Very much avoid farmyards. They avoid cattle farms more than any other type of farm. No seasonal use of farmyards. There was no evidence that males and females used them differently. <coughs> so I think there was an awful lot of talk and farmers were showing videos of cattle in the, our badgers in the cattle shed and cattle, uh, badgers going into feed sheds and things like that. It's not saying that it's not happening, but it's a nice bit of science to show that it's, that's the exception rather than the rule. And then the, oh yes, there's another, and another strange one there. If a badger was going to visit a farmyard, it was more likely to go into an equestrian yard. So why that would be, I don't know. <coughs> um, so that's, a, that's a, um, the team. So Enda Mullen uh, put all that together for me. And as you can see, uh, DAFM is uh, your version of, of the Department of Agriculture. Um, and then the TCD guys, that's Trinity College in Dublin. So we're working on that. And then lastly, I just wanted to bang up some pictures to show you that the Department of Agriculture actually, how am I doing time? Are you okay? Yes. I'm, I'm going over. Um, the Department of Agriculture were very helpful in terms of relocating uh, badgers into that area. Uh, so we had two rescue badgers and they came along and they, um, they knocked them out, they weighed them, they took samples, they vaccinated them, then this poor unfortunate is now having its belly shaved, they're tattooed, microchipped and a general check over including their teeth. These are both a young male and a female and then it was a soft release so you can actually see the mesh here, we have a high fence here with a uh, low electric uh, along the bottom. And they didn't go as far as putting collars on them though because that's so expensive. But those, those guys were there for months and then we know that the female went off with the local dominant male in the area who was called Juan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have names these guys. And we don't know for sure, but we suspect that the young male might have been possibly taken out by the, the dominant male, which would 